Mark, welcome back to the show, man. It's great to visit with you. Cable, no, appreciate it, man. It's been too long. I miss you. Yeah, absolutely. I was starting to feel uh, a little slighted because you weren't returning my texts or emails and, you know, come to find out you're off gallivanting around in Alaska again. Yeah, I was, I was a little bit out of pocket there. So, <laughs> but uh, you know, like you said, hopefully that's a, a good enough excuse. But yeah, I was oh, up in Southeast Alaska with some buddies of mine who uh, coincidentally, I mean, they're in the radio game as well. So they, they host uh, ESPN Outdoor Line Radio out of Seattle. Oh, cool. If any, if any of uh, your audience is interested in some uh, kind of like uh, Pacific Northwest uh, salmon hunting, fishing info, uh, that's a good one. But yeah, super good guys. So yeah, we we're just uh, up there chasing bears around for the week and doing a little bit of fishing and uh, it was a good time. Yeah, so I'm jealous. It seems like every spring we talk and you're either coming back or making plans to go to Alaska. How many times have you been? Oh man, super fortunate. Um, you know, I grew up you know, my dad had a lot of buddies up there, so I didn't even know how good I had it. So I used to fish up there a lot as a kid. And then I think I've hunted it though, you know, as, as an adult, um, like four or five times, something like that for a couple, uh, two, couple times for Sitka blacktails, which is a really cool hunt. Um, a couple times for black bears. Uh, and, uh, yeah, yeah. So it's it's good, man. I I love it up there. One time. And I remember this was a few years back, but, uh, you lost your blacktail to a bear, didn't you? Yeah, that was a pretty wild hunt, man. It was definitely like really skinny on the deer. Uh, there just were not a lot of deer, but there were a lot of bears. And and so, yeah, we hung my my deer off of like kind of like a, a cliff face, if you will. Um, and I mean, I still it was still like the best spot to do uh-huh. it, but uh, it still didn't work. And, and they got it from us. So that was that. <laughs> so, yeah, one of my uh, a guy that used to design my guns he, he built me a nice seven mag he went on a diy caribou hunt up there and i can't remember mm-hmm. which part of alaska he was in but uh, they shot four bulls and lost all but 40 pounds of the meat to grizzlies unbelievable man that yeah. is so crazy you know then you, you just you know i personally worry and i don't know how much merit there is to it but like then you don't want to like train these bears like oh yeah there's people you know free food like you know it's like oh my gosh you oh, just, yeah. you're not creating like a future bad situation when something like that happens yeah well and they you know he had like a 357 i don't remember what caliber handgun and he would shoot it like at the bear's feet and the bear just didn't care so these bears had clearly been in contact with humans before and it's in a, it was in an, uh, a region where it was um, tribal lands, you know, native, um, I guess the, maybe the Inuits. Um, but anyway, they didn't kill bears there. They didn't hunt any, none were ever harvested. So they kind of had a free pass, no pressure. And oh, just were, you know, acclimated to, to hunters and realized, oh, hey, the buffet's here. So, <laughs> You know? <laughs> like you got to hand it to them you know i yeah. mean uh, you know it's a pretty it's a pretty smart move yeah um so did you end up getting a black bear so i did yeah i'm uh super fortunate shot a really nice bear um he's a little bit rubbed up which i i, I knew he was a little bit rubbed when i shot he's probably a little bit more rubbed you know than i thought but you know totally mature boar um a really cool thing up up where we're at is you know and with a lot of bear hunts as you know i mean you check your bear in uh they take some measurements they pull a tooth things like that mm-hmm. so um i didn't realize the bear was as big as it was but it was a pretty it was a solid bear the skull went uh 20 and a 16th when the person oh, wow. checked the bear in you know but that's one of the measurements that they take so um that was pretty cool and yeah i mean um what is boone and crockett on a black bear 20 inches I think like 20 for like the, the annual book or something like that. And 21 mm-hmm. for the all time. But okay. um, so, but yeah, it was so big. Yeah. Nice. Definitely bear. mature boar. I'll, I'll be curious to, um, you know, call back. I need to call back and find out when you can find out, but um, you know, get the age on that bear from, from the tooth that they pulled. Cause it'll be interesting to, you know, con, you know, I guess contrast that with, you know, that measurement and how, you know, was it, was it a really old bear? Was it, you know, like just a average age bear? Like it, I'll be curious to know that. Yeah. Yeah. And so I guess these bears had been out of hibernation for a little while at this point. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think some have probably been out for, you know, since, you know, sometime in April, like we were up there essentially right smack dab in the middle of May. 
Um, so I think, you know, you know, in April, you'll probably start seeing some bears up there. Uh, and then, uh, they kind of continually, you know, keep coming out, but, um, no snow though, huh? Uh, in the high country there was, but not, not down low where we are at. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's on the bucket list. I gotta, I gotta make the trek to Alaska because, you know, the, the financial implications are, are a big limiting factor for a lot of people, but you could do a DIY black bear hunt or they're like those guys that were hunting caribou, my friends, mm -hmm. or even moose and you know, all that stuff you can do for under $5,000, which, you know, it's still expensive. Travel is expensive. Logistically, it's a pain in the ass, but, um, it's not like you're spending 30,000 on a, on a bull moose. So, um, right. Well, and if you think, well, even if you draw a moose tag in the lower 48, you're going to have a couple G's just into the, just into the tag. Right. Which yeah. is, uh, um, <laughs> if you're though, lucky enough to draw one, right. If you're, yeah. Right. You know, so yeah. like, you, you know, you got that going against you. So yeah, there's definitely some more economical, but very high adventure, full Alaska experience type things, um, that you can do up there where a person's going to have you know, an absolute blast. And like you said, it's logistically complex. I mean, particularly if you live far away, like you and I do, and a lot of folks, I mean, there's, you know, a lot of layers to the travel, to the travel, to the travel of just getting where you're trying to, you know, hunt mm -hmm. and then get home and getting meat home and things like that. I mean, there's definitely, you know, it's not as simple as a lot of hunts, but at the end of the day, it's still worth it. You know, I mean, it's just, it's just so beautiful up there and there's just, you know, there's nothing like it. No, in the part of uh, Alaska you were hunting, are there brown bear as well? So probably, you know, as the crow flies, not that far away there are. Mm -hmm. Where we were at, uh, it's just black bears, which is nice. Yeah, that's cool. I was hunting um, elk in Montana with my buddy and uh, Ty Stubblefield. Um, uh, you probably know Ty. Yep, uh, yep. Formerly mm -hmm. born and raised, now he's with BHA. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Ty kind of took us to his honey hole and he was like, all right, there's no grizzlies in here. Yeah. No, it's cool. Okay. Well, so we don't have to worry about that. It's just black bear. We ran into this guy. It's like so random. We're in the middle of the forest, like three or four miles away from our, our camp. And some dudes walk up, like only people we saw all week. And one of them's like, holy, is that Ty Stubblefield? Like, <laughs> Cause he recognized him from the videos. And, uh, and they start visiting and, and I thought he was going to just ask Ty to like sign his elk call or something. But, uh, anyway, th that guy and I have, um, followed each other on social media ever since then. Nice guy. And he was like, Hey, remember wh where we met in the woods? And he sent me a picture yesterday of a grizzly bear in a meadow. And he was like, yeah, there's, there's definitely, he was out, he was black bear hunting. And I was like, Ty swore there were no grizzlies. He goes, this is the second one I'd seen. So they're doing well in the lower, lower 48. And dude, those, you know, I mean, uh, the, I, they're amazingly cool animals, but they do, they spook me a little bit, man. Like, I yeah. mean, it's definitely in my thoughts when I'm considering, you know, where I'm going to go, you know, and particularly like, you know, like with the family now, you just, and I think also getting older, you're just a little bit more cognizant of your mortality and you're like, right. I don't know, maybe I'll go somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, for sure. And I think grizzlies are the, the one bear or the, the one animal in the lower 48 that I like really have a, a healthy respect for. Like, I'm not worried about getting attacked by a mountain lion or wolves or, or anything else really. Um, black bear, not so much. They're typically going to run from you, but grizzlies, man, those are the one that I'm like, uh, yeah, you better be you better have a healthy level of fear for those things and respect. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Which I, yeah, I, 100 percent do you know and, and like you're talking about or we we're talking about a little bit earlier i can't remember if it was on or off air but it, you know it, and again like you can theorize about these things i don't have the personal scientific data to back it up or anything but you if you got a an unhunted population it does seem um possible that they're just gonna like not have that you know maybe a little bit more innate or either learned fear of, of man right you know right. so if, you, if you're just constantly learning that there's no consequences to your actions like yeah that's how you're going to behave yeah no it's certainly a two-way street that's an interesting way to look at it but um uh, we just said we have a healthy respect and some level of fear of these creatures and they need to kind of reciprocate that <laughs> otherwise it's a bad deal 
<laughs> that's that's my hope at least yeah. but uh but yeah i mean I, I mean there's there's no question they're definitely you know need animals and and uh, i don't mind that they're on the landscape but like you said just got to be uh you know like i said respect and and also you know try and make the best decisions you can be when you're out there uh yeah. in the same places where they are do you want to hunt one someday oh i would for sure yeah yeah so yeah, me too. maybe it's... maybe i'm being, maybe that's maybe i'm being a hypocrite i'm like hey leave me alone i don't want to kill you or i don't want you to kill me i want to kill you <laughs> right yeah i definitely want to do a brown bear hunt um and i won't discriminate between uh, a grizzly in the lower 48 you know if they ever give us that opportunity but like i just said here's a dude who's sending me pictures of a grizzly where three years ago ty ty and ty hunts there a lot and he's like there's no grizzlies here well now there's grizzlies there so yeah who knows? Yeah. Oh man. Yeah, um, what about your turkey season? I know you you love the long beards. How did your uh, How did your season end up? Man, it was, it was, it was good. Um, you know that that bear hunt, which like not complaining at all, was kind of right in the the middle of our turkey season. So that definitely ate up um a good chunk of it. And then uh you know with uh you know wife and kids, I was kind of tried to at least be uh you know respectful on kind of like the front end and and the back end of that. So there's probably a couple of days where I wanted to go out, but I didn't go out. Mm-hmm. But I cut out um our first season. So I drew a first season tag. That's kind of how our, our, t- our seasons are structured. The the first couple are generally go on the, on the draw and hunted with a, a good buddy of mine. And uh, he's got a really great piece of private that he knows super well. So um, met up with him and, and we hunted and shot a, shot a nice bird uh, uh, essentially right off the roost in the morning. So mm. we had, uh, we're actually, we're five for five. Like it's crazy. Like I never shoot birds off the roost but you know going with him and his place like it's you know he's got a pretty dial there's a good population of birds so we've shot birds off limb essentially five years in a row which is super cool and i didn't think we're going to do it this year that they kind of went the other way and this this guy looped around um and uh interestingly enough um it was uh, a double so the last year shot big mature double bearded toms which oh nice yeah yeah i i I did several years ago i shot a triple bearded jake cables oh that's cool i shot my first uh double bearded tom in south texas last year and i came home and i uh i pinned it on a piece of cardboard and used like borax salt to for the fan and the and the beard and i it was done and i left it out there on the back patio for i don't know like a week longer just because i was lazy Mm -hmm. and the wind blew it off the table the whole huge piece of cardboard and the dog essentially ate the the double bearded oh no yeah yeah no i'll show it to you it's uh what's left of it it's just kind of all falling apart all falling Dang. apart there yeah that was, it was sad a, it was, it was a also a 12 inch beard <laughs> 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 and i did not beat the dog because i was i wanted to but i was like well who's the dumbass that left this out here essentially on the ground and she didn't even eat it she just licked the salt off of it but it ruined it uh, oh, so shame on me, but uh, but yeah, that was cool to to see that. Um, double bearded and a triple bearded Jake for you. Wow. So that was that was several years ago, but yeah, I didn't know Jake's even would grow three beards. To be frank with you, it was uh, I wasn't expecting it. You know, I was just like, I oh, yeah, this bird. You know, that was actually my first year when I moved to Wisconsin. So I got here a little bit late and and just went out to a piece and was like, yeah, I'll buy one of these late season tags and called in a a three pack and they yeah. came into like five yards and you know of course their heads are kind of you know weaving in and out and finally one step you know step far enough away i'm like okay i guess it's you you know <laughs> yeah so that's interesting because you guys just get the one tag right so it's like it's, what, what if you would have shot two birds there would you have been in violation of the law so I only had bought one tag for that season, but mm-hmm. actually for some of those latter seasons, there's leftover tags that you can buy one a day. So, mm. I mean, I theoretically could have had multiple tags in my pocket, but yeah. at that time I was like, dude, I don't even know like where I'm going or, you know, I'm just going to throw one tag in my pocket, you know, looking back you know, if I had a couple, it would have been, for you sure. know, uh, you know, pretty easy pickings, but, uh, uh, but I was still stoked. I was like, oh my gosh, you know, like I just got here and I killed a turkey. This is amazing. <laughs> That's it's like false hope, like with turkey hunting sometimes, because the first turkey I ever killed was sounds like a lot like um, that property that you have with your buddy, because 
we set out a decoy in a sendero in, in the hill country and birds fly off the roost. We're like 75 yards away. Here he just struts right to the decoy. Boom, dead. I'm like, turkey hunting's the easiest thing ever. And it's so great. <laughs> and there's been so many humbling days and hours and moments uh, ever since then. And it's probably been, I don't know, 15 years, 12, 15. I don't know. Lose track of time. But it's been a long time. And I've killed a lot of turkeys since then. But God, sometimes you got to grind for them. Oh, yeah. Um, they, just, they generally leave me pulling my hair out. But they are I don't they're not think. smart. They're not smart, but they sure they sure make me think they're smart sometimes. Yes, they're just scared of everything. Uh, yeah. which, um, but it's all I love, man. There's there's I, I find few things actually more just purely fun in the hunting world than chasing turkeys around. Man. Yeah. That's that, that's about as good as it gets in my book. So what subspecies of longbeards have you taken? So uh, back in my Washington days, um, we'd hunt Rio's. So mm -hmm. I shot and Washington's actually a pretty cool state in that um, you can shoot or at least they have in the state. You've got Easterns on the west side of the state and then you've got some kind of Rio's in the southeast and then uh, Merriam's in the in the north. So you kind of you can really if a guy wanted to or a person wanted to, they could, you know, get a good portion of their slam just just in one state. But um but I only hunted uh, Rio's there, um, killed some mixed birds when I lived in Nebraska. They kind of have a lot of hybrid birds there. I've heard um, that, yeah. And then, uh, and that's kind of more on the Eastern side. But then I, I did kill a true Merriam's uh, in, the, in the Pine Ridge up in Nebraska, which is kind of like the Northwest corner and then Eastern's back here. So I got, I got three of them, which is like not really intentionally necessarily, but uh, uh -huh. just, you know, through, just through where I've been at. So it's pretty cool. Um, don't, uh, don't have that uh, Osceola, you know, but maybe I'll, maybe I'll get to Florida someday. I don't know. Well, you, you're doing better than me. I've only killed Rios. I've killed a mess of them in Texas, but I haven't, I haven't hunted any anywhere else for turkeys, seen them, you know, while I'm, you know, spring bear hunting or elk hunting, you know, always see Merriam's in the mountains and Colorado and New Mexico and um we had this guy on last week who just set the world record for the shortest turkey slam he killed all four subspecies in 45 hours and he had his own plane so he was flying he started in his farm in alabama shot an eastern there went to florida shot an osceola went to nebraska to the pine ridge same area that you shot yours in and uh got his um who was his Merriam's there yeah uh, and then went up to south dakota for uh the uh maybe the rio what would see what he would have got there yeah it would have been the rio okay so, yeah so he killed all four and he wanted to do it in four separate states so that there wasn't any of that interbreeding so it wouldn't be like pure strain yeah but he said um he said he thought the merriams were the easiest ones to hunt like the, the least wary i don't know you've killed one what do you think i mean i i don't know maybe i just wasn't a good turkey hunter but those just <laughs> give me give me fits up there a little bit but uh i think they do i think they do gobble more i think i think the merriams and the and the rios I, I think they're just more inclined to gobble and get into it a little bit at least at least uh -huh. from you know in, in my limited experience with them but um he said easterns were the hardest man i i would agree with that these birds i, I mean like you know eric in the office here man he's like i mean he is a really good turkey hunter and he you know, kills a pile of those damn things, but man, they just like, you know, they, they'll gobble on the limb a little bit and then they shut up. They just seem wary and finicky and mm. just, yeah, they're, I think they're tough birds. Um, do you like, or do you ever have to resort to just deer hunting turkeys? And by that, I mean, just sitting in a blind because you kind of have them, maybe you have them pattern or maybe just it's a waiting game. I mean, that doesn't appeal to me, but I told you about that story off there about that Turkey I was after this year. And I ended up just sitting in a pop-up, which I hated. I, it was it was raining a lot of those days, but yeah, I was like, this turkey is he's figured me out. He's been pressured, and so now I'm just gonna try to ambush him. You know, yes and no. Like generally, I'm pretty you know like to move around a lot, but you mm -hmm. know there there are those times where you're like, man, like nothing's worked and nothing's gobbling. Um, and then yeah, you know, I'll just kind of go to a place where turkeys like to be. And, you know, at least, you know, try and wait something out for a little while, or sometimes you'll, you know, you can wait there for a little bit and the bird will fire up, you know, and then mm -hmm. you can, you know, make a move on them. So, and sometimes I'll do that by napping. 
Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually my nap program. I'll find a nice spot where turkeys like to be. And then, you know, just, you know, get, get a, get a little shut eye. And sometimes you you wake up to a gobble. So. Uh -huh. I don't think I, I might've, yeah, actually I did tell this story on the air one time. So I also had one other screw up during Turkey season. I ended up killing two birds. Um, but I, I could have, I could have killed four. Um, I, no big deal. No sweat. It's been fun chasing them. But, uh, the other screw up, my buddy and I were at his, we, we left South Texas where I'd shot two birds and he'd shot one. And he, he actually had a, a Turkey lease not far from there. It was like an hour away. So we'd run up to his Turkey lease. It's like 4,000 acres, giant property. And no, yeah, I never been there. We just set out a decoy in a Sendero kind of where we think the birds are or an area they're roosting. So it's getting close to the, you know, it's afternoon. We're just going to wait them out, wait for them to start gobbling and hope they see the decoy in the Sendero. Well, it's freaking 95 degrees. The sun's beating down. So we're, we, we leave where we're sitting and we go across the Sendero to get in the shade. Well, by doing that, we couldn't see down the Sendero and I was just kind of there sitting there, you know, trying not to get poked by mesquite trees and bitten by ants and maybe catch a nap. And I look up and this damn gobbler is standing right at my decoy, just strutting. <laughs> and he's 10, he's, I, I'm not saying 10 yards, he's 10 feet away from me. And so I like, oh my gosh. reach down to grab my shotgun and he's like, oh, out of here. <laughs> yeah, we didn't see another turkey on his place, but uh, yeah, he caught us with our pants down for sure. Oh my gosh. See, that's just one of those things where you're like, ah, it's so close, you know? Mm -hmm. No, but he never gobbled. He just came in quiet and we couldn't see, like, if we just stayed where we were, we'd have seen him coming from 200 yards away. But it, well, it is what it is. It, uh, shame. It, again, shame on me. Um, so you mentioned fishing. Um, I feel like this is the, like, the dead part of the year. Like, I think there's two really big lulls, like February in between deer season and turkey season firing up. And then I think, like, June and July are like, you know, it's really those are the times when I do more fishing than anything else because you know we still always have hogs to hunt in Texas, so we're kind of blessed in that manner. But uh, what were you fishing for in Alaska? So yeah, uh, my buddy Robbie's got a super nice boat up there actually. So he's why he's up there is he's a fishing guide in mm. in the kind of spring summer. So he's up there uh, just grinding and man, he is surgical when it comes to fishing for king salmon and other salmon bottom fish. So um, he's got it dialed. So um, we did a little bit of salmon fishing. We caught some black rock fish. Uh, we caught some shrimp while we were up there. We, you know, dumped the shrimp pots. And, and uh, so we, we, uh, oh, we nice. ate like kings while we were in the field, which was like pretty awesome. <laughs> so, Heck yeah. Um, but yeah, so uh, yeah. So if anybody needs actually a fishing trip up north, man, check out Prince of Wales Sport Fishing uh, with, with Rob Inslee, man. He, I'll, I'll plug him. That's an advertisement. But I, I'm serious, man. Like he, he's good. Like he's, he's got it dialed for sure. And so when you're back home in Wisconsin, what do you, what do you typically fish for in the spring and summer? So walleye? here, I mean, yes, yeah, a little bit of walleye fishing. Um, you know, if I'm being quite honest, like I don't hit it that hard with, with the girls. Now I've got two, two girls, you know, they're five and seven. So we'll go, you know, harass the bluegills a little bit uh -huh. and things like that. Yeah, uh, same here. Yeah. Uh, the Wisconsin river is not too far away from here. And that's kind of like definitely a, a, you know, a multi-species smorgasbord, you know, you can, yeah, I catch, it's got a little bit of everything. It's got a walleye, small mouth, uh, sheephead, you know, all, all sorts of stuff in there. So probably different than your, the sheephead that you guys have. Where yeah. You're I was at. about to say sheep's head is a freaking saltwater fish with big old ugly teeth that, uh, but not like the sharp teeth, like the look like, um, kind of like, like the they've got dentures or something, you know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> are those they are they kind of like black and white striped yeah those, that's them uh -huh. yeah uh -huh. mm -hmm. so these one uh i think they, they call them sheep sheep head or sheep's head a freshwater drum they get called okay. they're like they're more of like a really silver fish like a gasper goo uh, uh man i, I think that's that. like a southern term we use for those okay i'll yeah. have to look what'd you call that a gasper goo i'm gonna i'm gonna look that up when we're done um <laughs> yeah. But I think, you know, a lot of people think that they're not like a really edible fish. They're kind of considered a trash fish, like throw it back. Like, oh, oh yeah, that's a gas for you for sure. Um, I don't know, man. They're like, you clean them right. There's, there's some good, really good tasting, you know, mm. white flaky meat on there. So yeah, I think um, uh, Jim and I actually fished, uh, caught a bunch of them with a guy on the Mississippi 
uh, probably last year, maybe it was even this time of year. Um, and even some good size one, but you get, you get that bloodline out of it. You get the, uh, kind of like that, um, layer of kind of like the, the darker meat or whatever that's, you know, under the, uh, right under the skin. If, if you trim them up and you don't really have to be like super liberal, you just have to be kind of cognizant to get those things off. I don't know, man, I'd be, I'd be hard pressed to tell the difference between that and, you know, a walleye or something else. They're, they're pretty darn close. Maybe not as good, but they're also not that far off. So, right. Well, if they're a drum species, uh, it's so crazy because we consider saltwater drum species, like wonderful table fare, um, redfish, black drum. And then you look at freshwater and people are like, I'm not going to eat that. You know? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I don't know why that is, but that's just the mentality. Um, so I'd say, yeah, I don't know. When people throw those back, I'm like, cool, more for me. So Right, right. Well, lots of exciting stuff. Um in the works for vortex and let's start with the uh the vortex edge because we actually haven't talked about that on the show before so yeah uh vortex edge so we're super blessed um and just to have the facility that we have here uh which we're actually in the process of even expanding right now so from uh you know from a, i guess a structure standpoint we have a hundred yard uh multi-bay indoor range uh which is you know one of the few in the country and it's just it's state of the art you've got um you know targets movable targets you can run them fore and aft you can spin the targets uh you can you can do just a little bit about uh everything on there so and actually excuse me i'm sorry i was talking about the 50 yard range there so the 100 yard range is is a, is a static range but it's still one of the few 100 yard uh ranges uh, you know, available and it, and it is just an, an awesome facility. Then we have the 50, which I was kind of just describing right. uh, where, where you have the, you know, you've got the, the mobile targets, it's a dynamic range. So you can shoot from, you know, essentially anywhere on the range, as long as you have the scenario set up safely. Um, so we do lots of trainings at both that are, that are open to the public. We do a lot of law enforcement training and things like that, but we also have a lot of classes that are open to the public as well. So if a person, you know, wants to take, um, you know, maybe they just bought a new pistol, but they're not super familiar with it and they want to be able to learn how to use it safely and responsibly. You know, we have courses geared towards that. And we have courses geared towards people that are, you know, maybe, you know, beyond that, uh, you know, and, and uh, pistol classes, carbine classes. Uh, we have an outdoor facility where we can do long range work where I think we can shoot out to, you know, um, uh, you know, close to 1200 yards there. Hmm. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's, uh, and then we have the, uh, the Virtua system, which is, uh, kind of like a, a 300 degree, almost like video wall system where the, um, where the trainers can pretty much dial up a multitude of, uh, scenarios, uh, where it could be like, you know, maybe it's, it's a robbery or something like this. And it's almost like, in some ways, it's like a choose your own adventure where the person oh. died, um, you know, number one, am I, am I going to engage, you know, should I engage, when do I engage, uh, and then based on the decisions they make through that process, that kind of shifts the, uh, the outcomes, so it's, it's really interesting, and it's an, it's an awesome training tool, and I'm probably not doing it the justice that, you know, one of the instructors could give it, but it just offers, um, people who need that kind of training to put themselves in those types of scenarios. So when hopefully they're not, but if they are presented with that real life scenario, it's kind of like they've been there before and they know how to react and what to do. Cool. So all of that sounds awesome. And uh, I'm looking forward. I think I'm coming up at the end of August, middle of August. I can't wait. It's yeah. going to be a blast, man. It's going to be for myself. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that. So if you are just, you know, a member of the public and you want to experience it, it's uh, you just go to the Vortex Edge website or what? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, yeah, you can look for a you know, list of available classes. Obviously, you can give us a shout. We can kind of talk you through like each class, what which ones you know, may be the best fit for you. And then obviously, you know, you got the schedule there and, and can can look at when they're going to take place. But um, yeah, lots of really good classes. Um, and uh, I think just about anybody can benefit from them. That's for sure. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And there's like 8 million first time gun owners now 
because of uh, the pandemic and social unrest and everything, those people need some training. And a lot of the a lot of the training facilities were closed during COVID. So you have all these people that bought guns that don't know what they're doing. I'm glad they bought them, right? I would much rather have more people owning guns than less people, uh, law-abiding citizens anyway. But, you know, certainly there's a, there's a, um, a vacuum there that's like, hey, there's, there's people that need the training that, that don't know what they're doing. So hopefully they're investing in that as well. Yeah. And I, yeah, I would encourage anybody that is out there, you know, we can all, we can all learn something. I mean, heck, you know, I mean, oh, for sure. know, going back to like the pistol stuff, like if I was going to pick one thing that I'm less familiar with, you know, that's going to be the pistol. If I was going to pick here. one thing, that's going to be like my EDC, which you're going to have with you, like all the time, it's probably going to be a pistol. Right. So like you said, I mean, you, you definitely want to get trained up on that and probably the hardest thing to learn. And also even just from a safety component, is the pistol right so and i think that's what probably a lot of people purchase so Mm -hmm. um yeah and and there's you know not once you learn kind of those basics and things like that you know then it becomes you know more fun too so you probably person's more inclined to be like oh i don't just need this just for something goes bad like i enjoy shooting this thing this thing is fun you know maybe i want to do some sort of uh, competition shooting event, or, uh, that's, that's my hope with all this is a lot of folks who maybe not were less familiar with firearms, get familiar with firearms and go, or get more familiar now. I mean, if they already have one, but you know, and they go, Oh, wow, these things, these things are awesome. These things can be fun. If I'm using it, you know, safely and responsibly, uh, it's, uh, it's more than just, uh, you know, some sort of insurance. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Uh, You know, it's like my wife, um, She's only ever shot handguns with me one time. And I was like, I can teach you how to do it. You know, she's like, what are you, some pro? And I was like, uh, no. She's like, well, then <laughs> I don't really, you know, I'm not interested in that. So that was all. And she's had her purse stolen out of her shopping cart in a parking lot. I'm like, the first person that should be carrying would be someone that's had that happen to him. But oh my no, gosh. Just, but if she just was, you know, had had that a little bit of training or familiarized herself with, with handguns a little bit more she'd be comfortable with it so for sure and i can't you know of course you know i work at vortex and i'm you know i'm plugging these guys but um i cannot say enough about the instructors i mean they truly are pros they know what they're doing um and they know how to teach you know what i mean mm-hmm. like it's definitely not something to be um no matter your experience level you know i mean they'll be you, it's not something to be intimidated by i guess so mm-hmm. um that reminded me of one other thing, you know, T-Bone Turner from Bone Collector. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So kind of in the same vein as my wife being like, no, I don't want you to teach me how to shoot a handgun. Um, we were at this archery shoot charity event and I'm there like trying to get my wife to shoot a bow at uh, cinnamon Creek ranch. And she's just not receptive at all. T-Bone walks up and he, and she's like, he can show me how. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so t-bone it, it, it's always funny he reminds me he's like oh yeah i, I remember I, sh- I i taught your wife how to shoot a bow but she wouldn't <laughs> listen to you yeah so there's a running theme in my marriage you can tell um yeah. we also want to talk about the venom which i've got right here which i which i love this scope it's a uh, 5 to 25 by 56 and this is brand new just came out like what two weeks ago Mm-hmm. Um, it is a, this is an interesting thing, I think, and you can tell me obviously being in the industry, but are 34 millimeter tubes be just becoming more popular? You know, so I'd say yes, as long range precision has mm-hmm. gotten more popular, you're seeing, you know, more of these scopes with a larger, larger tube diameter and, and what that essentially is giving the scope, you know, from a functionality perspective is within that tube, there's, you know, the internal erector system, right? So that's kind of what's going up, down, left, right, when you're adjusting your turrets. So, you know, kind of the, the, all things being equal, the more room you have for that to move, the more travel that you have when you adjust your elevation turret or, or your windage turret, but I'd say predominantly in long range, you know, you're thinking your elevation, right? Mm-hmm. So you can dial you know, you can dial that longer range shot. If you had a a smaller diameter tube, you'd run out of room and it'd be like, well, I'd like to dial for that thousand yard shot, but I've I've run out of room. Yeah. Okay. So that explains the 34 uh, millimeter tube. 
And this thing is essentially for long range um, shooters or hunters. And at a price point, that's not going to break the bank. I think it's MSRP is like six ninety nine. Yeah. And I think street price, you're probably talking about the $500 mark, but it is, I mean, I've run that scope a lot. Actually, Jim and I have upcoming a, uh, it's a beautiful uh, optic. It, yeah. I mean, it's like, it, it's, it's, it really is a killer optic. Like you said, it's got a, it's got a five to 25, you know, five X zoom range. It's first focal plane, 56 millimeter objective, 34 millimeter tube. It tracks unbelievably well so you've got you know exposed turrets for for dialing your elevation um optically it does really 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 well um i mean it's definitely a scope that i you know i'm confident saying it outperforms its price point um almost like it's it's a little bit scary actually i mean it, it is a really really cool scope for what a person has into it and like I started to talk about a minute ago, Jim and I have an upcoming uh, match, uh, long range match that we're going to uh, participate in. And that's what we threw on both of our guns, you know, and, and my gun is probably, you know, pretty, pretty super Gucci high end gun that, that we built in a kind of uh, for the purpose of like a, a previous uh, piece of content that we produced. And his is a little bit more, uh, you know, budget conscious, it's definitely not budget rifle, but um, man, we taught both of our guns with that. We've been shooting those rifle scopes and, it's not, not once I've been like, well, you know, if I would have had this other one, then I'm like, no, this works pretty damn good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what uh, caliber do you shoot long range? So both of our guns are, uh, they're just six, five Creedmoors, you know, pretty, pretty standard, you know, which is like crazy. It was, you know, the new hot thing, you know, 10 years ago and now it's like vanilla ice cream, but, uh, but, but yeah, but yeah. it's still like what there's still this culture of like six, five douche more, or like, well, I don't know what it is. Like what, what I have one, I shoot, I, it's my, my hog and coyote gun. I got a suppressor on it. Love it. Um, drop. I mean, compared to like shooting a two, two, three at a hog where sometimes the bullet you kill the first one so let's just apply it to thermal hunting right okay that's what we do in texas a lot of times yeah. at night first one's dead you shoot it in the head but then it's just putting pinholes in these things as they're running off well that's with a you know 55 grain bullet now you've got 120 grain 65 creed more around and things are dropping right there so that's yeah. i'd like to change and and certainly see a um, application for the 65 in in the hunting world um obviously it's a great round for long range competitive shooting as well. Yeah. 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 I think, you know, I think we're, so, you know, people love to hate on got it. A or, bad you know, rap, though. <laughs> people like I mean, you got people that are in the corner of like, it's, you know, it's the best thing ever, you know, and then you got the other people that, you know, or other folks, you know, some folks that, you know, they, they love to hate on it. And I just think it's a really cool little efficient cartridge and it's really yeah. not that little. You get to push a pretty, pretty big pill, you know, moderately fast and it shoots slippery bullets that perform well at long mm -hmm. range so i think there's a lot to be said for it personally now what's the biggest also, grain bullet you've seen is it 147 143 somewhere in that range so yeah i think i've shot like some um 143 like um uh el eldx's out yeah. of it and things okay. like that uh yeah I, I think where i think where people start you know it's not magic you know, and I think, you know, some people think it's just like this, this magic cartridge. I mean, it's, it's a really cool little efficient cartridge that you can definitely do a lot with. I've shot a handful of deer with it. I killed an odd ad with it. Um, but you don't fit the bill of the, speaking of bill, of the, the typical 6'5 Creedmoor Western guy. Well, you live in Wisconsin, so you're not Western. But if you're, if the brim of your hat was just a little flatter. You know, it would go well with the six five creep more <laughs> but you've got a nice curve there like i do on our, our vortex yeah, tabs, so. give it, you know, just a little bit you know just yeah, to remind yeah. you that it's there but um i don't i don't hate it i think it's a great cartridge i think it's you know it's super versatile. i just think it's funny to to to, to some to pick which side you want to be on on that day and just be like so this day i'm going to kick it this day i'm going to defend it because there are so many people because I'm, I'm uh, indifferent really, you know, but there, but there are, like you said, there's the love it and then there's the hate it crowd. So uh, now I wouldn't take it elk hunting. I think that that's silly when I have a 300 win mag sitting in the safe, but some people do. Yeah. You know, and I, I think that's just being, you know, cognizant of, you know, being maybe uh, I think you should always be selective of your shot choice. I think where maybe, um, you know, and I'm a big fan of the 300s. I shoot a 300 WSM 
a lot for mm -hmm. a lot of things. That's kind of my do all killing stick. If you told me to pick one big game cartridge, that's probably what I would personally pick. Uh, I just like it a lot and have had a lot of success and, and have confidence in it. Um, you know, sometimes your shot angle isn't perfect or sometimes your shot isn't perfect or sometimes you have, uh, you, you know, for reasons X, Y, Z, you need to take a follow-up shot that maybe isn't the best angle. And, you know, sometimes a little bit bigger pill with a little bit more gas is gonna, you know, accomplish that task better. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that said though, like I said, I've, I've knocked a lot of things down with that 6.5 Creed and it, it, it does really well at the same time. But um, I don't know, there's a lot of great cartridges out there. I like breaking shoulders though on big game animals. So, I mean, that's why I like, that's why I like the 300. Yeah. Yep. I'm, yep. I'm not afraid to shoot through an elk or a moose or you, I mean, you name it, you're, you them in square in that front shoulder and it's lights out. They're not yep. going anywhere. No. Nope. Um, now also one other thing though, we need to mention, and I'm super excited about this. I've got the app downloaded now is the fury HD 5,000 AB. And this thing is like having, I mean, your dope chart in your binos essentially. Yes. Yeah, that that is a really, really cool optic. Uh, you know, as the name implies, 5000 yards capable, you know, max reflective range on there. Um, that's probably, you know, a little bit further than I'll probably hunt with. But uh, so. <laughs> uh, no, but you've got a 6.5 Creedmoor. What are you talking about? Oh, that's about? true. My goodness, <laughs> that. um, but uh, but yeah, so I mean, this is it's going to do a really good job with ranging. You know, it gives you ranges fast. It's got the. Uh, you know, the, the onboard applied ballistics, uh, uh, functionality there. So like you said, it's like having a real time, you know, once, once you get all your, your data input into the unit, um, you know, it's like having a real time dope chart to the yard, to where you're standing, you know, the, the, the elevation that you had, it's got, um, you know, onboard environmental sensors on it. You know, you've got the full applied ballistic suite of bullets that you can select the bullet, uh, that that um that you're using uh and it's it's a robust you know selection of bullets that a person can choose from you know the handful that i've plugged in have have been in there right so you've got mm -hmm. that applied ballistics uh curve in there which is just like almost like a custom bc um and uh yeah man it's uh it, it's cool i mean you you range it and it spits out your ballistic solution and you know dial and hold dead on and and make a good squeeze and let her rip. So it's, um, it's, it just, it's just really, really accurate. And it just gives you just that ultra accurate ballistic solution um, and fast, right? You know, mm -hmm. you're not checking a dope chart that, you know, maybe, you know, maybe you set your, your temperature for your dope chart that you have taped to your stock, which actually I still do as a backup, right? Not that I've ever needed it when I've been using the Fury, but um, I still do because I'm all about redundancies. But um, man, it's just like, it does save you time. And I, and I know for a fact, there's animals that I would have been able to take had I had that system versus a different system, just because it was, you know, a couple, couple seconds made the difference. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking about that, that, I brought up this terrible memory in my head of, uh, well, it wasn't terrible, but it was, it was just a missed I'm sorry opportunity. I brought you back to that place. No, that's too. okay. I mean, I actually, I made a good decision, um, but I was hunting mule deer in West Texas and big old muleys there, but very sparse population. Like I think we hunted, it was a five day hunt. I think I saw three bucks, but on wow. the last day I saw a 200 plus incher and he was sitting in the sun standing in the sun on a bowl it was we're driving because we basically would drive through these canyons there's no roads up there in these mountains the mountains are four or five thousand feet tall um but you're just driving through the basically the bottoms of them and we just stop and glass and glass and glass and just glass for hours and hours and hours and finally we just we drive into this canyon and we see this this buck over there and um my gun i had a 308 on that hunt and i had slid down some rocks and we took the gun to the range and shot it and it was way off um and so you know it was the gun got basically essentially the just gun had gotten dropped and was like all right well the, the guy was like you can shoot my 300 win mag i was like okay cool so i'm i'm sitting there looking at this deer and it's a throw it up on the hood of the truck type of deal 
not just not, not take a rush shot, but he's like, yeah, he's five. I think he said he's five seventy. Mm-hmm. And at the time I'd never shot I never even attempted a shot at 570 yards, especially on an animal. And I was like, well, you know, where do you want me to put it? You know, how, how, how sure are you that it's 570? He's like, just put it on that. Just put it over his back. And just let it rip. And I'm like, uh, I was like, no, I think I'm good, man. I said, we can try to get closer. If he busts us, he busts us. And it was the last day of the hunt. And I had to get on a plane the next morning. I'm thinking, you know what? If I wound this thing, I'm going to be sick about it. And then I'm going to have to cancel my flight. And then my wife's going to kill me. And it's just going to be one. It's, it's one bad decision is going to lead to a litany of bad outcomes. Yeah. So I didn't shoot. But man, I have never seen another 200 inch mule deer. <laughs> <laughs> that is, I mean, you made a very responsible, you know, hard decision to make in the yeah. moment, right? Like yeah. you're amped up, you're excited, you've been hunting all week. It's what you've been looking for your whole life. You know, I mean, holy yeah. man, I've never, I've never, I don't think I've even seen 200 inch deer, you know? Yeah. Um, and, uh, but that, that's the right call. But like you said, now, if I'd have had this. that theory, maybe <laughs> like, dude, like I nearly guarantee hundred percent different outcome. Yeah. You know, yeah. like you're uh, the, 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 the term, just put it over his back and send it. I was just like, uh. so, <laughs> he, he actually apologized to me because he got, he kind of got mad that I wouldn't take the shot. And, um, before I left, he was like, I'm sorry, man, that's so impressional. He's like, I just, we, I paid a lot of money for this this lease and we haven't killed a nice buck off of it uh, this year. And I just hate passing up on the opportunity, but you know, you made the right call for you. So, well, you know, I mean, I never lost sleep over it Yeah, in in a bad way. I still think about, I still, I still dream about what just that buck just sitting there in the sun, just the sun, just his antlers, just shining like a beacon of shoot me. And no, just (laughs) there'll be another one someday. I fingers crossed. No, I mean, you, you 100% made the right call. And, you know, like you said, any number of outcomes you could have just missed. But, man, you know, if, if you made a bad hit and lost it, you'd be kicking yourself 10,000 times more, you know? Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I would, I've never said that outfitter's name on the air, but I haven't ever recommended him to anyone else. Um, <laughs> it was, there was, there was five of us on the hunt, and that was the only opportunity, like, you can call it an opportunity. It was a marginal one, marginal one at best, but mm-hmm. that was the only one that uh, we had. So I don't know when I say the the deer population was pretty sparse. I mean, it was, I don't even think they should have been hunting that place. Um, no. But anyway, so yeah, big fan of the Fury HD 5000 AB. Uh, these are expensive, but you're getting a lot. I mean, you're getting a lot for your dollar. Like we just talked about. Uh, what yeah, is the I mean, price point on these? You know, boy, now you're really testing me. Uh, I think it's going to retail for, you know what, let me look it up. Cause I actually, I'm kind of spacing on that right now, but, um, but while uh, you're doing that, think about this. Do you, do you think this is something that like long range hunters, uh, I mean, long range shooters will use, or will they just stick to their, you know, traditional, well, I don't know what, I don't know, not one. I've never shot competitively, whatever it is you guys do. So, I mean, so yes and no, like, I think maybe like at a match, maybe not just cause mm. the way they're structured, like you maybe don't need that, but uh, I mean, for sure, for long range shooting, long range hunting, I mean, it pairs with third party uh, devices. So it's going to, it's going to pair with your AB equipped Kestrels. It's going to pair with your AB uh, equipped Garmin devices, right? So it will pair with those third-party devices that a person, if that's what they want to mm-hmm. use, they certainly can. Um, or you can use the unit on its own. And it's got, you know, like I said, it's got that AB functionality. You can select those AB curves. You can, um, it's got the environmental sensors. So it's going to give you, you know, your pressures and your temps and your things like yeah. that. And the cool thing is, is, you know, and this is during more of the setup process, but you pair it with the Fury app, right? So you input all these things on your phone. <clears throat> once they're, once you got it dialed into the unit, which you can have up to three different rifles in there at a time. So you could have, you know, three different, um, you know, if you had like, if you had a six, five Creedmoor for, for instance, and your 300, you know, it'd just be a matter of entering the data, you select the one that you want and, and go on your way. But once you do that, you don't need your phone anymore. You can, you know, I don't think anybody really leaves their phone at home, but like, man, once it's in the unit, it's in the unit and, you know, zap that range, get that solution, 
dial it, you're good to go. Yeah. Well, now all my Onyx stuff is on my phone. So it's like we're getting smarter. Like, okay, now we've got all of this technology in these binos. Now we've got our GPS, our Onyx, our maps all on our phone. So like I don't even the only Garmin thing I'm taking into the woods is the inReach. So I can yep. let people know I'm not eaten by a grizzly bear. <laughs> <laughs> so, little eyes. uh yeah no it's, it's pretty crazy and, and like you said i mean you know those furies are they you know a chunk of change yeah but it's like oh well you've got your binoculars you got your range finding you've got your ballistic there's definitely a lot of functionality and tech built into that unit where you know if you parted that out and was like and we're like well i'm going to carry these three separate things like it kind of all starts to come out in the wash you know mm-hmm, mm-hmm. well i'm a big fan of them um certainly looking forward to taking them to new mexico uh coming up here in september and oh i'm gonna take them to i've got africa before that going back to africa in july so and we do uh, the opportunities for long range shots are abundant there so yeah that's gonna be cool forgot about that that's our makeup trip from last year gotcha uh, from covid but uh but yeah um well mark always a pleasure my friend congrats on the black bear yeah, thank you. Thank you. No, no, it's always fun, man. So yeah, whenever we get a chance to talk, whether it's on air or off the air, man, I truly enjoy it. So appreciate you. Likewise. Well, thanks again. And we will do we'll do it again soon, I'm sure. Awesome. Thanks, Cable.